So of course our goal here at, at a conference like this, one of our main goals is to uh, help the body of Christ uh, understand how scientific findings can be interpreted from the biblical worldview. That's one of our main objectives. So uh, scientific findings like the fossil record, it's very, very important that we're able to correctly interpret those, that we can interpret those from the biblical worldview. So much of what we focus on are those important subjects. But uh, through science, we can also, in science, we're exploring God's creation, which is a marvelous, marvelous thing. And through an e this exploration and through the teachings by, of science, we can develop a better appreciation of who our God is. But unfortunately, we live in a world that teaches a different worldview. In secular schools today, as we've, as we've heard from previous talks, the scientific community is dominated by a philosophy of naturalism. They're dedicated to explaining our world as coming about through purely natural processes. And their view is that all life on Earth has descended from one common ancestral form a long time ago that developed eventually into ape-like ancestors that eventually gave rise to man. This is the view of the scientific community by and large. They, they stand in agreement with this, these teachings. And that's what your kids are being taught in public schools. So what I hope you're going to hear a little bit today is the difference. How science can be taught from the biblical worldview. And I hope when you hear this presentation, maybe you'll question a little bit the uh, decision of having, your, having kids in the secular schools today. How can they come out of secular schools today with a correct worldview, with a correct understanding of our world? You spend all week in, se in schools being taught a secular, an atheistic worldview, and then one, one hour, maybe two hours at church being taught a biblical worldview. How can we, how's that possibly a balance that can lead to a healthy understanding of the world that we live in? But there is an alternate way of, of interpreting Earth's history, and so that's one of our goals. Uh, the scientific community believes that man evolved from ape-like ancestors, but the Bible speaks of man very much differently. Psalms, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. The NIV renders that little lower than the heavenly beings, but the NASB, which by all accounts is a better rendering of those original texts, the Hebrew and the, the Latin versions, renders that a little lower than God. We're not the, like the animals. We know this. We're not like the animals. We did not descend from animals. We are distinct. <clears throat> it's within biology that we see most of the evidence of design that's within God's creation. There's a lot of cosmological design as well. Through the study of astronomy, we learn all about the fine-tuning of the universe all the physical constants that must be exactly the way they are for life to exist anywhere. But from within biology, most of the just really amazing examples of design are found. And so we want to kind of look at some of those. I mean, from bottom to top, the human body is an, ex an extraordinary example of God's creative power. From the DNA that's in our cells, there is information within all living cells. Information, DNA is an instruction that tells a cell how to make proteins, which are all the machinery that makes life possible. DNA is information. Everything we know of information says it comes from an intelligent source. The fact that we find information in the cell should lead us inexorably to the conclusion that the cell also must have come from an intelligent source. And scientists know this. They know it's information, and yet they stand firm in their belief that this information just popped into existence through purely natural process. An extraordinary amount of information can be found within these cells. There are three billion base pairs of DNA in the average human genome, three billion. By comparison, one human cell contains about as much information as you will find in a thousand books, or a millimeter pile of DNA contains about as much information as 500 stacks of books reaching to the moon or a single stack, stack of books reaching to the sun. It's an incredible amount of information. But unfortunately, we have inherited a lot of scientific thinking that came before us. Scientists from, in Darwin's day viewed the cell very much differently than we, view it, than we know it today. One of the most famous evolutionists of Darwin's day, Ernest Haeckel, 
describe the cell this way. And by the way, Ernest Haeckel named the bacterial kingdom, the kingdom Monera. He named the bacterial kingdom. He describes the cell like this. And this is in 1883. Darwin's works were published in the 1850s in later revisions, 1883. Not, the cell's not composed of any organs at all, but consists entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. It's nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump, lump of mucus or slime. When that's your view of the cell, that it's nothing but a little lump of mucus or slime, it's easy to envision a way of such a thing forming in a little pond full of scum, if that's your view of the cell. Easy to think about the cell forming all on its own through pretty natural processes, but we know that the cell is far from that today. The cell is a vastly complex construct. Even today, we really do not fully grasp everything that's happening there in the cell. We know the big processes but there's so much going on and we're discovering new things every day. In the human body, there are approximately 100 trillion cells and the human body makes well over 1 million cells per second. A million cells per second and that's a very conservative estimate. In fact, you make more than a million red blood cells per second. An extraordinary amount of processing take place. Today, we know that the cell is vastly more complex than they viewed it in Darwin's day. An evolutionist, Michael Denton, turned uh, intelligent design advocate, described the cell this way in his book, Evolution of Theory and Crisis. He says, to grasp the reality of life as, as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. Nothing but a little lump of mucus or slime in Darwin's day, back to our day, an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. This is how the cell is viewed today. And it's these cells in the human body that are responsible for all the processes that take place. Cells of a variety of different types make up all of the organs, the tissues, the organs, and systems within our body. There are four main types of cells that make up every organ in the body. So your stomach has some connective tissue, your blood cells, the, your blood itself is considered as connective tissue. It has some epithelial tissue, some skin, some muscle tissue, some nervous tissue, every organ in the body contains these general types of tissues. Organs like the liver, extraordinarily complex extraordinarily complex organs in the human body. The liver itself is the chemical factory for the human body, is a chemical factory. It's been estimated to process at least 500 different functions. The liver itself has at least 500 different functions. It regulates the composition of the blood, including your blood sugar levels, protein levels, fat levels. It removes toxins from the blood, like alcohol, which is a toxin, People that drink a lot end up having liver problems because of overworking the uh, liver in this way. It processes or metabolizes most of the nutrients, stores some nutrients, produces su important substances like cholesterol and many proteins, and it produces the blood clotting factors. When discussing biological systems, it becomes difficult to identify what the organs that belong to this specific system or to discuss an organ in relation to one system because in reality, many organs are involved with multiple dis different systems within the human body, such as the liver. You need multiple different types of cells to make an organ. So on, at every level, the biological systems within the human body illustrate what we call irreduci irreducible complexity. One of our speakers talked about irreducible complexity before. But it, you need several different types of cells to make an organ. You can't have an organ without all of those different types of cells pre-existing. You have to have several different types of organs to make up a biological system. Your various systems, like circulatory system, nervous system, digestive system, endocrine system, all require multiple different types of organs. All of those organs must exist simultaneously for that system to exist. What Darwinists must explain is how something like the complex human body came about through slow and gradual processes over long periods of time. But in fact, at every level, you see irreducible complexity. You see irreducible complexity within various structures within the cell, like the flagellum or ATP synthase complex proteins that cannot function unless every single component of that protein exists. 
Things like the or an organ cannot exist unless every single component of that organ is in place. Biological systems cannot exist unless every single organ that makes up that biological system exists. And the psalmist probably does the best job of, of uh, describing this. For you formed me, for you formed my inner, inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. When studying the human body, we are confronted with the designer behind the seemingly interwoven components that underlie the, the, the human body. From the DNA molecule, which is self-thread-like, to the cell-to-cell-to-cell -cell -to -cell communication, or the interconnectedness of the various organs that make up systems, no cell or system in the body works independently of any other. They are knit together, just as the psalmist describes. At every level, there is example of irreducible complexity. You have to have these multiple components existing at one time for them to function. And, and Darwinists have to explain how these things come about through slow and gradual additions of individual components. Let's just go through some of these systems. I want to just illustrate some of the marvelous designs that we find in biological systems. The skeletal system is made up of some 206 bones. At least the adult body has some 206 bones. More than half of those are in the hands and feet. A newborn has something closer to 350 bones because many of those fuse together. The skeletal system works together with the muscular system to accomplish movement and also protects internal organs. So systems work together. The skeletal system is also responsible for making new cells for the circulatory system and the immune system. These systems are interconnected. And very recently, it was discovered that the skeletal system is also involved with the endocrine system, uh, the system that makes the hormones, the chemical messages that are released by glands in your body that tells some other part of your body what to do. We now know that the skeletal system is, is also part of the endocrine system. These systems are highly interconnected. Bone is itself an extraordinary substance, stronger than granite. Your compact bone is stronger than granite, a block of bone half the size of a computer mouse can support 10 tons, four times the capacity of concrete. And unknown to many, the bones are actually constantly remodeling themselves. You have cells in your bones called osteoclasts that are constantly eating away at the bone, and then that bone is rebuilt by other cells called osteoblasts. So your bones are constantly remodeling themselves. The bones that you have now are not the same as the bones you had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. They're constantly remodeling themselves to meet the specific demands that you're placing upon them. You've heard the expression, uh, you know, people that are real big. You know, you'll hear an expression for people that are like real big saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just look big because I'm big boned. You ever heard someone say they're big, just big boned? Yeah. Well, it, in, in, in one way it's true, but you're not... Uh, big because you're big boned your bones are big because you're heavy your, your bones are actually retooled to meet the additional mass that you're placed upon them or if you have a chance look at someone that's involved with some sport or activity that requires a lot of stress on particular parts parts of their appendages like their hands look at the hands of a person that's a professional rock climber for example and you'll see the additional bone development that has taken place because of the additional stresses they put, along, put upon that particular part of their body. Your bones, specific joints in your bones have inspired uh, engineers to develop robotic joints. Stuart Burgess published this article in the Journal of Mechanisms and Robotics describing the work that he had done developing a robotic knee joint after studying the human knee joint. It's, it's big business today. It's what, called, it's what we call biomimicry. The, you, you study biological systems, biological components, and use those to develop or improve our own technologies. And many things that we use on a daily basis have been developed through biomimicry. Velcro was developed through biomimicry. Um, the, they're developing adhesives after studying the gecko's feet, the way geckos can stick to walls. Turbine, the blades, the turbines for your big windmills have been uh, modified based on studying humpback whale fins. They're developing a, a swimwear after studying, studying shark skin. Uh, and things like uh, display devices for cell phones are being designed after studying the way butterfly wings reflect light back in iridescent light. So a lot of things are, are 
improved upon by studying biological systems. It's what we call biomimicry. And Stuart Burgess uh, reports this in uh, this journal of mechanisms and robotics in 2013. But in 1999, he discusses this exact research in the Journal of Creation. Stuart Burgess is a creation scientist. And in 1999, in the uh, Journal of Creation, which is the technical publication by Creation Ministries International, he reports on this research. Uh, so they, Creation Ministries International, we, got, we have Taz Walker and Michael Lord in the house. They have a booth back there. They, they've already talked about Creation Magazine. Cre the Journal of Creation is the more technical version. So if you want something a little, with a little more meat to it, consider stopping back there and get you a, a subscription to the Journal of Creation. But he describes his work with the knee joint in the Journal of Creation back in 1999 and some of the same figures that were used in this 2013 report are present there. But he describes the knee as irreducibly complex. He says, opponents of neo-Darwinian evolution have argued that it is impossible because many biological systems require an irreducible number of parts for a system to have useful function. An irreducibly complex system is one that has to have multiple parts to function, and the loss of even one part will cause the system to no longer work. And that's what makes an irreducibly complex system so difficult to explain through Darwinian mechanisms, because they have to explain how something that we now have came into existence by slowly and gradually adding parts. But if it won't exist, if you even remove one part, how is a Darwinian evolutionist going to explain how something comes about in that way? He, re he continues, the concept of irreducibly, irreducibility requires a set of characteristics that must exist simultaneously. Such characteristics are termed critical characteristics. The advantage of identifying critical characteristics is that they give an indication of the minimum quantity of design information that must exist simultaneously in the genetic code for a mechanism to have any useful function. The irreducible mechanism of the knee joint, he says, for example, is shown to contain at least 16 critical, critical characteristics, each requiring thousands of precise units of information to exist simultaneously in the genetic code. This demonstrates that the knee could not have evolved, but must have been created or f as a fully functional limb joint from the beginning of its existence. Irreducibly complex, from bottom to top. DNA to specific cellular structures like, back, like flagellum and ATP synthase, to specific organs, to biological systems, even individual joints. Irreducibly complex from, bo from bottom to top. The nervous system is remarkable. Your nerves serve to communicate information from one part of the body to another. For example, from sensory organs to effector organs like muscles, to this, from the central nervous system out to your muscles. It connects sensory system to response systems. There are nearly 45 miles of nerves running throughout the human body. Now the functional cell of the nervous system is what we call a neuron. A neuron is a cell that basically transmits an electrical signal from one part to another. This video, a little bit difficult to see on this, just shows some neurons growing out. Neuron is a long thread-like structure. The longest nerve in the human body is about three feet in length and runs from where it connects with your spinal cord all the way out to the muscles in your calf. You have individual nerves that are three feet in length. In a giraffe's neck, there are some that are closer to 15 feet in length, a single neuron. There are approximately 100 billion neurons in the human body total. One billion in the spinal cord alone. These individual neurons connect with other neurons and or effector organs like muscles. An average neuron will make between 1,000 and 10,000 connections or what we call synapses. For, and there are 100 trillion synapses minimum in the human body. It's an extraordinary number of connections. The brain is itself just a mass of neurons, neurons connected together. Mark uh, Cosgrove is a professor of psychology at Taylor University, and he describes the brain this way. The brain is a swarm of cells in which everything is seem seemingly connected to everything else. The connections, though, follow a plan or an order. Your brain is just a mass of these neurons, all connecting with one another. But it's still debated today whether all of the mind actually is localized within the brain, because the entire nervous system are neurons connected to one another. There's a big cluster of them up in here, but is all the mind localized to the brain? This is something people still debate. The brain itself is an extraordinary organ. 
at the adult brain weighs about three pounds. 2% of the body's total weight, but uses 25% of the body's oxygen and or eight and energy. 25% of its glucose, 25% of its ATP energy, although it only consists of about 2% of the human body. Some brain cells make up to 200,000 connections with other brain cells. There's an estimated 60 to 240 trillion connections in the cerebral cortex alone. Connections. Werner Gitt has a doctorate in engineering and was a former head of the Department of Information Technology at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. You can find a couple of books from Werner Gitt back there in the back. He stated in the journal The Third Fundamental Quantity that without a doubt, the most complex information processing system in existence is the human body. If we take all human information processes together, Conscious ones, consciousness ones and unconscious ones. This involves the processing of 10 to the 24 bits of information daily. This astronomically high figure is higher by a factor of 1 million times than the total human knowledge of bits stored in all the world's libraries. It's an extraordinary processing center. And still the evolution of the brain remains a mystery today. In, the, pres in uh, the preface to the evolution of the brain in 1989, John Eccles states that while recognizing that much is unknown or only imperfectly known, I have been able to unfold the fascinating story of the hominid, brain, hominid evolution of the human brain using creative imagination restrained by rational criticism. An important... Uh, accessory to the brain, the eye. The eye is actually in some books considered a part of the human brain. It is so well integrated in the brain that the eye is actually considered by some to be actually part of the brain. And it actually performs a lot of processing, the kinds of processing that we attribute to the brain. The eye is an, is an extraordinary organ. It contains over 10 million specialized cells called photoreceptors that are found in the retina the back portion of the eye, packed into an incredibly high density of 200,000 per square millimeter. There are two types of cells in the retina called rod and cone cells, aptly named because that's how they're shaped. One is rod shaped, the other is cone shaped. The cone shaped cells uh, are, are those that detect color. The rod shaped cells are those that detect only a, a, a black and white. The rod shaped cells in particular are extremely sensitive. They can respond to light far below our own technology and can, in fact, respond to as few as one photon of light. So it's because of this, consequently, if you're, when, the light, when it's very dark, things look black and white to you, that's because you're only seeing at that point in time with the rod cells. The cone cells are not activated by such low light levels. And the eye performs a lot of pre-processing. 10 billion calculations actually occur within the retina every second before the image actually gets sent to the brain. Let me show you a short clip about the eye from uh, the documentary God of Wonders. Moves about 100,000 times each day with automatic focusing and can handle 1.5 million simultaneous messages. The eye is also self-cleaning with built-in wipers and cleaning fluid. And the eye even has the amazing ability to assemble and heal itself. Furthermore, God has designed the human eye to distinguish millions of colors and his mind to appreciate the rich spectrum of beauty seen throughout creation. Most people don't realize this, but the eye is part of the brain. It's an extension of bud in the embryo that buds off the brain and there's a little window that develops in the skin called the cornea of the eye. Isn't that great? The eyeball is located precisely where a clear window develops in the skin, so we may look through. It's sensitive to light over a range of about 10 billion to one. That is from the brightest uh, thing we can see, maybe a sun-drenched snowscape, uh, down to as little as a single photon of light. That's our smallest unit of light. And of course, everywhere you look, the focus is automatic. 
and the two eyes look at the same spot wherever we look. Uh, it's like somebody with a pair of six guns that can fire the guns and everywhere they shoot, the two bullets make one hole instantly, everywhere. And that's what our eyes are doing. Everywhere we look, they converge in the same point. If they were off by just a degree or so, you'd see double. Everywhere I look, I see overwhelming evidence of the handiwork of God. And surely, when man denies that, he's without excuse, just as Romans chapter 1, verse 20 tells us. Darwin himself spoke to the difficulty of explaining the evolution of the human eye. He says, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. But then he actually goes on to explain how he believes the eye could have evolved, which really amounted to little more than comparing different eyes of different complexities. This one's very simple. This eye, the eye in this organism is very simple. The eye in this organism is a little more complex. The one in this organism is very complex. And here's a much more complex one. Didn't actually explain how something like that could evolve, just, just pointed out several different levels of, of uh, ocular complexity. The respiratory system, also amazingly complex. The job of the lung is to exchange gases with the atmosphere, breathes in oxygen and discards uh, carbon dioxide uh, that results from the breakdown of sugars by the cells. The uh, main functional organ of the lungs is these little sacs that called alveoli that are there to uh, increase surface area. But to, to illustrate just how much surface area they provide, if you were to flatten out all of those sacs, they would cover an area of about the size of a tennis court. So there's about as much surface area in your lungs as there is over the surface of a tennis court. And the lungs are remarkably self-cleaning. And think about how important this is. When you uh, see the, uh, the, the, the dust in your room, in your house, when the sun is shining through and you can see all that dust, or if you have a, you know, an air filtration system, just how quickly the filters in your air filtration system get clogged up. Think about all that debris in that air coming into your lungs on a daily basis. How long do you think your lungs would stay functional if they weren't self-cleaning? But you have these, you have cells in your lungs that secrete mucus. The reason why you actually have that mucus is part of the cleaning mechanism. And then, and then additional cells that have cilia, little hair-like structures that beat and they move all simultaneously wave-like functions to constantly move that mucus up and out of your respiratory passages to your esophagus where you swallow it. And at this point, I usually point out to my students something very gross about what's in that air, you know, the, the dead skin cells that that mostly is. And, you know, in a way, we're filter feeders. You know, there's a lot of filter feeders. You know, like clams, there's clams in the, uh, in the ocean that are pulling in water and they filter feed in basically the same way. The debris in the water gets stuck to mucus, cilia pull it back and they swallow that, all that debris. You know, and so in one way, we're filter feeding, except instead of uh, detritus from the ocean, you're filter feeding the skin cells from your uh, siblings and your parents and stuff at home in a way effectively eating one another on a regular basis. This is awesome stuff you learn by going to Christian schools. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Awesome. Circuitry system. The circuitry system contains o over 60,000 miles of blood vessels. In, the chi in a child's body, closer to 100,000 miles of blood vessels in an adult. Now, to give you an idea of just how many how much that is, the Earth's circumference is 25,000 miles. So the blood vessels in an adult human body, if stretched out end to end, could actually go around the Earth four times. It's an extraordinary thing. Uh, there was a, the Bodies exhibit has come to Seattle a couple of times, and I took my human anatomy and physiology classes there when it was here, and they had a couple of exhibits where they... They had managed to fill the circulatory system of an appendage, even there was one of the whole body, with uh, uh, like a latex substance and were able to eat away the rest of the tissue. So all you saw was the, hand, the arm or the, hand, the circulatory system of the arm and the hand. And it looked like the entire thing was nothing but circulatory tissue. It's a remarkable thing. The heart, of course, is the powerhouse of the circulatory system, constantly beating to moving blood throughout your body. <clears throat> it beats over 100,000 times in one day 40 million times in a year and 3 billion times during the average human lifespan. It pumps a total of 1.5 gallons every minute. That's enough to fill a 50 gallon drum per day. A million barrels in the average human life, lifespan. 
It is an enormously hard-working organ. If your voluntary muscles, your uh, skeletal muscles, try to do what the heart does, they would burn out in no time at all. But the heart just keeps doing that over and over and over. We can't design anything like the heart. In one hour, the heart outputs the energy necessary to lift 2,000 pounds a meter off the ground. In one hour. So every hour, your heart could basically lift a small car or a big animal off the ground every hour. Now, how, how long do you think it would take before your arms and legs would tire out trying to do something like that? But your heart can do that hour after hour after hour. Now, one of the most extraordinary things about the circulatory system is, is the blood clotting system. And so you have this extraordinary uh, ability to stop the flow of blood whenever you're cut and your, and your blood starts to leak out, this extraordinary clotting system. Like many of the biochemical reactions within the human body, it, this one is extraordinarily complex, but must be because all of the components that are necessary for your blood to clot exist there within your blood. And if there wasn't close, really careful regulation that prevented it from clotting until necessary, your blood could essentially solidify at any point in time. But, and this is a typical diagram that shows all the feedback mechanisms, the check loops that are involved with making sure your blood only clots absolutely when necessary. But uh, uh, rather than trying to explain your way through this, I'm gonna just let an expert uh, handle this for me. Here you go. I cut my finger this morning and it's bleeding. But if I put this bandaid on, it'll stop in a while. Did you ever wonder how it happens? I mean, does blood just stop? Because that's what it's supposed to do? Why doesn't our blood clot before we get it cut? I guess we just die then, because all our blood would harden up and stop flowing. Did you ever wonder? Did you ever wonder why? Blood clotting is a very complex process involving thousands and millions of triggers that have to act just perfectly with one another to create the final outcome. Let me see if I can tell you how this works. First, you get a little cut like mine. Imagine you're in my bloodstream. There's a bunch of traffic going on, and pretend you're floating around with a kajillion other red blood cells, all with oxygen backpacks. Everything slows down when you get near the cut. This is called vascular constriction. In short, your body limits the flow near the cut because it knows something is wrong. And of course, you feel pain. So, a protein in your body called fibrinogen arrives on scene. Fibrinogen is primarily responsible for stimulating platelet clumping. Thrombin. Essentially cuts off the ends of the fibrinogen. Platelets clump by binding to collagen. Upon activation, platelets release adenosine 5 diphosphate ADP and TXA2, which activate additional platelets, serotonin, phospholipid, liver proteins, and other important proteins for the coagulation cascade. Activated platelets change their shape to accommodate the formation of the plug. Oh, sorry, I digress. Anywho, this complex thing called the Stewart factor converts prothrombin to thrombin, thereby converting fibrinogen to fibrin. By the way, the Stewart factor wasn't active until it was activated by the Christmas factor. Okay, there's a lot more to this process, like this goes there, and binding, receptin, who knows what. It's very complicated, but the net result is a clot. Stops the bleeding, cut heals, clot dissolves, you're on your way. Isn't that neat? Okay, one, of the, one other important uh, function that the circulatory system plays, although you could argue this, is do you discuss the immune system in the circulatory system or a lymphatic system or, a, you know, a skeletal system also plays a role here, is the immune system. And the immune system is itself incredibly complex. Uh, and it's, it, I, will, I will refer back to this later, but it, it, there, there are a number of cells in the immunity system that all work together in concert to help protect you from all the pathogenic organisms that are out there that could cause harm. Uh, bacteria and viruses, fungus, even your own cells can at some point cause harm. Those that uh, become cancerous, for example, are ultimately fought and destroyed by the immunity system. 
A number of cells are responsible for this. A number of highly specialized cells, some uh, that eat other cells. There are cells in your body that eat other cells called macrophages and neutrophils. But all of these specialized cells come from one stem cell in the bone marrow. So this one cell eventually becomes all these other cells due to what's called, a, 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 due to the alteration of what's called the regulation of expression. So they, all cells in the body have the exact same DNA. All of these cells have the exact same DNA. But these different specialized cells, much like the different specialized cells I mentioned before, the nerve cells and the muscle cells and your, and in this case your red blood cells, these individual specialized cells develop because in one cell, certain genes are turned on and other genes are turned off, but in a different kind of specialized cell, completely different genes are turned on and off. It's what they call gene regulations. What genes are active in producing proteins are regulated carefully to produce these various kinds of specialized cells. It's an extraordinary thing. All these come from one uh, type of, of uh, stem cell that comes from bone marrow. But like I say, your, your immune system actually has multiple systems that are involved in this process. Again, an irreducible complexity at every level. How do you explain something like the origin of the immune system when it's involved, when so many systems are necessary for it to function? Circulatory system is necessary. Skeletal system is where the stem cells come from that produce not only red blood cells, but your white blood cells as well. The lymphatic system is kind of a parallel system to your circulatory system. That's where you find your nodes, the various lymph nodes, and those kind of things are part of your uh, lymphatic system. And your tegumentary system, your skin, is also heavily involved in, in immunity as well. Now, one of the one of the main functions of the immunity system is, again, to fight foreign pathogens, like these bacteria you see right here. These red cells in that picture are, and specifically the bacteria that cause food poisoning, salmonella. It's the bacteria salmonella, the one that causes food poisoning. When you get these kind of pathogenic organisms, they would, could eventually kill you if it wasn't for your immunity system. And one of the main fighters, the, one of the main cells that's fighting to protect you are these uh, are cells like this one that eat other cells. This is a neutrophil. The uh, neutrophils uh, can only eat a few cells before they die. The macrophage, a much bigger cell eater, can eat many, like 100 cells before it dies. But this is a picture of a neutrophil actually eating a rod-shaped bacteria. This is the bacteria that it's eating right here, this neutrophil. They, they basically are, they are, are, are uh, involved in a process called phagocytosis. They basically can eat other things, just pull other things directly in. Here's a short video showing human root neutrophil cells crawling around inside your body. These are autonomous, independent cells that cruise around your body like little mini blobs. Do you remember the movie The Blob? Old movie The Blob, this big blob-like thing that would swallow up people? Well, that's what your white blood cells are like. These big macro macrophage and neutrophils are phagocytic cells. Uh, they cruise around. And then when they find something they need to eat, they'll surround it with these little feet-like extensions and then just pull it in straight in through their uh, cell membrane, kind of wrap their cells around it. These are just neutrophils responding to the presence of a bacterial infection. But they just cruise around through this human body. Now, very recently, we knew that the, these white blood cells use the circulatory system to move around inside the body. But only very recently it was realized that they don't actually just get swept away in the circulatory system like your red blood cells. Instead, these white blood cells, like your neutrophils and macrophages, actually roll along the inside surface of your blood vessels, along the surface called the endothelium. They're actually rolling along the inside surface, making specific connections, protein to protein connections along the surface of the red blood cell as they move down the surface of the blood vessel. But then, how do they know where to stop? Interesting discovery made there, too. Watch this. So you'll see here a bunch of red blood cells getting swept down through the circulatory system. And along the surface, these are your white blood cells making these specific protein-protein connections with the endothelium on the inside of your blood vessel. But then, at the site of inflammation, these proteins assemble a lipid raft forms beneath them, very newly discovered stuff. These proteins will then reach up make contacts with those intracellular proteins and when the neutrophil reaches them they immobilize it and then the neutrophil will spread out at its leading surface squeeze itself between the individual cells that make up your blood vessel into your tissues and go searching for the infection that's there it's an extraordinary thing 
It's an extraordinary thing. But I want to point out something else to you that's kind of cool about the immune system. Now, when you look at diagrams of the immune system, they kind of look like engineering diagrams, right? I mean, this is so cra crazy complex. But one thing I want to point out, so these individual spheres are those individual red blood cells, multiple types. But notice what's happening here, here, and here. Those two are making connections with one another. This is what they call antigen presentation. These cells, so cells like the neutrophils and macrophages, when they eat some foreign substance, like a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or even one of your own cells that's becoming, uh, that they need to destroy for whatever reason. When they eat one of these, what they end up doing is breaking it apart into pieces and then they take one of those pieces that is referred to as an antigen and they present it to another cell in the immunity system. It's what they call antigen presentation. It actually just extends it out of its cell, and these two match up, and one of them presents it to an, the other. That's what's happening right there. And this is part of the controlling mechanism, act, activation mechanism, that's responsible for what ha happens as a result of that antigen being present. So I found this particular antigen. That other cell then helps it determine what should happen from there. One of those is what's called a helper T cell. So this. This is like a macrophage one your, or one of your neutrophils presenting an antigen to this helper T cell, and then this helper T cell will decide, help it decide what happens after that. Do we make antibodies, do we activate macrophages, or do we activate killer T cells, which are the cells that destroy your cells in the event that you have a cancer or something, it's killer T cells. But it's this, I want to point out something about these antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that bind to antigens. Okay, so they're y loosely Y-shaped, little diagram of what an antibody might look like, and an antibody binds to a foreign particle that's called an antigen, okay? But an antibody only binds to one antigen and one antigen alone. It's a lock and key system. It is customized to bind to only one thing. And these antibodies are in your plasma floating around. They're made by a specific cell called a B cell. They're floating around and within your, uh, uh, and when they bind to a foreign antigen, they can deactivate certain, like they can deactivate a virus or they label substances for destruction. So when they bind these, your immunity system then responds to them in various ways. Either they come around and the macrophage will eat them up if they're bound by antibodies, or in the case of viruses, it can actually uh, in, uh, dis deactivate them on a, on a level, okay? But one thing we've discovered, so, these gene, a gene is required to make the, a protein. That's what genes are. Genes are instructions that tell cells how to make proteins. And these antibodies are proteins that label foreign substances, okay? What we realize is that a, this, a gene to make an antibody is actually assembled from several templates. So there are several templates in your, on your chromosomes that are used to make antibodies. And what your cell does is it takes several of these templates, several of these subunits that it uses as templates, assembles them together, so it might splice these two together and then it moves, removes part of this one and then splices a couple more together and then may remove part of that one and it ends up with a gene that it's gonna use to make an antibody, okay? This was discovered, a good, this was discovered quite a while ago, but right away they realized that the number of gene subunits that are there that can be recombined to make the final gene could in no way account for all the antibodies that are found in the human body. Because there's bazillions of antibodies in the human body. Every, an antibody will only label one foreign substance and one foreign substance alone. And you come across tons and tons of foreign things. But, and they realize there's no way that number of gene subunits could create that many antibodies. So they just figured out, they just decided based on their worldview, that when the cell is splicing together these various subunits, mutations happen. So when it splices them together, a little mutation happens here, it splices these, mutations happen, and these mutations can be responsible for all the incredible numbers of antibodies that are present in the human body. Until they eventually realized, after the exposure to the antigen, this final gene is edited. With single nucleotide changes, it comes back and specifically edits that gene to make the exact protein that's necessary to bind to this foreign antigen. Now, I've said we would be mo so much further along in cell biology genetics if scientists just realized that what they were looking at was designed. 
They don't look for design, and so they don't find it. They assume everything's due to random mutations. You know? They had to stumble across it that it was actually due to specific genetic recombination, specific edits to those that gene was made as a result of exposure to that antigen to make that antibody. It's an incredible thing. The origin of the immune system is still a mystery. There is still much debate in the journal Cell, Embryos, and Evolution. There's still much debate on how the vertebrate immune system evolved and even much less consistent on its relationship to the event system in invertebrates. One other interesting thing about the circulatory system, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this. Figure we got one light day in late September. But your circulatory system is involved in temperature regulation. So watch this carefully and see if you can see what's happening. Your, your body is able to open and close blood vessels as needed to di divert blood into the areas where it wants it to go. Vasoconstriction, in that video she mentioned vasoconstriction, your body can constrict and dilate blood vessels to divert blood wherever it needs to go and does this for a number of reasons. That's what inflammation is as well. Your body is opening up blood vessels to divert blood in that area and help white blood cells get in there. But as well, when you get, like, when you get real hot, like when you're playing basketball or something and you realize your face gets red, you ever see someone playing their face gets all red, that your body is opening up blood vessels at the surface to help it radiate off heat. Your body can specifically control what blood vessels are open and what blood vessels are closed at any given point in time. This is at the capillary level. It's an extraordinary level of control, extraordinary. But that may even pale in comparison to what takes place in fetal circulation. There's something remarkable that takes place in fetal circulation. Um, now the fetus, remember while it's still in the mother, does not, does not use certain organs because those processes are taking place by the mother. So things like the liver are not needed because the mother is taking care of all of those chemical reactions. Remember the, the liver is a, a chemical factory for the cell, but the mother's liver is taking care of all that chemical processing. And the lungs are not necessary because the mother is doing the breathing for the baby. So those are unnecessary, but they become necessary at the moment of birth. So what's kind of extraordinary about this is that uh, before birth, up until birth, these organs like the liver are completely bypassed. A blood vessel completely bypasses the liver. It sends enough blood into the liver to supply it with the nutrients to help the cells develop, but it also doesn't need the lungs. So the lungs are diverted too. Interestingly, there is a, a gap, a shunt, between the right atrium and left atrium that allows blood just to go directly from the right atrium to the left atrium instead of going to the lungs. And when the blood leaves the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery contains a shunt that allows the blood to go, go directly into the aorta. So the lungs are completely bypassed. And then at the moment of birth, boom, everything changes. The shunt between the right atrium and right ventricle closes to force the blood out the pulmonary artery, and that shunt between the pulmonary artery and aorta close, so the blood goes through the lungs simultaneously, as well the diverting shunt there at the liver closes down, blood starts flowing through the liver, boom, at the moment of birth. It's extraordinary. But then again, fetal development in general is very, is very extraordinary. Fetal development is itself very, very extraordinary. God takes care of us from day one. That what takes place there in the mother's womb is just extraordinary. We, uh, a number of verses from the Bible talk about God's loving care of us. Uh, Jesus himself expresses great love for children. He says, in, in one case, he said, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he, he was indignant and said to them, per permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. God loves us, and, take, and in particular, children. There's something very, very pure about children. <clears throat> Fetal development is probably a most, most remarkable because, again, remember, all of those specialized cells come from originally one cell. One cell, and through the regulation of gene expression, that one original cell, that egg that was fertilized by the sperm, that one cell in the very beginning becomes all of these highly specialized cells. Cells like nerve cells and muscle cells, uh, the rod and cone cells of the eye we've already talked about. Hair cells are the cells in the inner ear, your ear and or in, in your inner ear that are responsible for both hearing and balance. 
You have, you have cells that make these little hair, hairs, and when those hairs move, that's how you know that you're moving, either that your head is moving or that you're accelerating forward or backward, it's because of these hair cells. Extraordinary, all of these specialized cells are made from one stem cell. And it's at the moment of fertilization that everything changes. Now this is, I want you to just watch this real close. This is right after the moment of fertilization in a zebrafish. This is a time-lapse video, but it will kind of give you a sense of just how quickly things take place in early embryological development. As soon as fertilization takes place, the two genomes unite, cells start dividing, and as soon as you reach a critical mass, the minimum number, as soon as the minimum number of cells are reached, each of those cells is defined, is, is given a job. They're, they, they're given their identity, they begin to specialize to the individual specialized cells that they will eventually become, those specialized cells become tissues. Tissues eventually develop and start forming organs. Organs start forming biological systems. It, it's a process that takes place very rapidly. Now, of course, this is zebrafish, and humans are much more complex than zebrafish. Humans have three billion base pairs, but you probably might be surprised to note that in, that entire time lapse sequence was only 24 hours. From fertilization to there, only 21 hours. Of course, the process is much longer in humans. It actually takes 30 hours, because of the increased size of the genome, the increased complexity of the human organism, it actually takes 30 hours for the first cell division to take place. About 15 hours later, it divides again. Three days later, you're up to 16 cells. After about five days, you've reached the stage called a blastocyst, the sphere there in the center. The outer cells will become the placenta, the inner cells will eventually become the baby. The blastocyst is carried down the fallopian tube by cilia, the same kind of cilia that are carrying your mucus out of your lungs. Then it becomes implanted in the placenta. During the next two to three weeks, everything changes after implantation. A disc forms in the center of the gastrula, the individual cells are assigned their roles. They start to migrate to different places within the growing fetus. And let's look at some of these stages. 32 days, two to three weeks at this stage. At 32 days, the heart and eye lenses become visible. The heart, liver, and pancreas are clearly visible. As at this stage, you can even already see fingers. The the heart actually begins to pump at day 21. So day 32, now at this, day, at this stage is when the first indications appear that a woman is even pregnant based on ovulation. The first indication that, the, that a pregnancy might be, uh, might be ongoing occurs at about this stage. And at this stage, not only is the heart already beating, the heart, these, the many or, other organs are already present. 47 days, at this point, not only are fingers and toes clearly present, but the uh, face has also begun to form. Both nostrils and the mouth are clearly visible. At 56 days, it's at this stage actually that the developing embryo is actually referred to first as a fetus, but I would call it a baby at eight weeks. And it's sadly at this stage that most abortions take place at eight weeks. Now, all we can see is external anatomy on this, but to make this case a little stronger, I mean, I think this is one, the issue of abortion, I think, is one we need to wake up to. And I think when we look at this, when we analyze what really is taking place here in, in develop, at these developmental stages and where a baby is at the time that, that abortion takes place, we really get an understanding of what's happening today. Now, this is also eight weeks. I want you to take a look at this video. This is a, a three-dimensional MRI video that was created at eight weeks. So, in addition to the external anatomy, at this point the transparency is, is not clear, but through an MRI, MRI we can really get the sense of how fully developed this growing baby is. And this is at eight weeks. Everything is there. And it's at this week, at this stage, that again most abor abortions take place. It's at this stage where Planned Parenthood will advise 
young girls that all that's there is just a mass of tissue. They tend to emphasize how small it is. Oh, it's just a small size of a blueberry. But whether we're 10 centimeters in size or 10 feet in size or 100 feet in size is irrelevant. Think about how big we are in comparison to God. A God that stretched out the vastness of the cosmos. When you consider the size of the cosmos, you really get a sense of just how big God is. Do you really think the difference between 10 centimeters and 10 feet is significant to God? It's not. It's clear that that is a baby. Everything is there. Everything is fully developed. And again, it's at this stage that most abortions take place, at eight weeks. There's some data. The graph is from 2002. The data below is from 2010, basically the same. Close to 60% take place at around the eight, you know, at eight weeks or, or less. More than 40% take place after eight weeks. More than 10% take place after 13 weeks. Just a, qu a few quick uh, statistics for you. By the age 45, about half of American women have an unintended pregnancy, and nearly one-third of those have an abortion. 85% of all abortions are performed on single women. Single women. There are about one million abortions per year. That's roughly about just less than 3,000 per day. And I, you know, I kind of wonder why it is that the church has become so silent on this issue. So silent on this issue. But then I stumbled across a, a statistic that might have made that uh, a little more clear. That uh, 73% of abortions are performed by couples that have re religious affiliations. 73% of abortions are performed by people with religious affiliations. This is a disturbing statistic. Disturbing statistic. And Jesus had some really harsh things to say about the mistreatment of children. And he called a child to himself and, and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a, a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I think we need to reawaken the church. We, are, we have become silent on this. We're so uh, involved with other, uh, with sins. Homosexuality having been uh, legalized. What is... Sexual acts between two consenting adults in comparison to the slaughter of a million babies per day in our country. I mean, this is something we need to reawaken, to reawaken ourselves to. We become desensitized to the horrors that are around us, desensitized to anything that has an emotional drive to it. The United States has some of the most uh, uh, of liberal abortion laws in the world. Every color there, the, every color there other than the blue has more stringent abortion laws than the United States. But that's changing. There's some good news. That's changing. We've seen a lot of legislation take place recently. In the last three years, between uh, 2011 and 2013, there were more restrictions enacted in that period than in the entire previous decade. So we are seeing some progress. But there's still some... Uh, up until recently, you were able to have an abortion at any stage in every state in the United States up until birth. That's how flexible the abortion laws were up until very recently. And still today, a girl can get an abortion without notifying her parents at an age where getting an aspirin at school is required. She can get an abortion at the same age without parent consent, yet at school she has to get parent consent to get an, have an aspirin administered. Now, how does this come about? It comes about by lobbying efforts, powerful lobbying groups. The whole drive behind this is money. This is huge money. It's an industry, lobbying efforts. And we really need to get back involved with lobbying. Now, I, the church is becoming uninvolved in politics. The church used to be the place where public discourse took place, but we become scared of being involved in, pub, in public policy and lobbying efforts. We're not prevented from lobbying. 
We're restricted. The 501c3 restricts religious affiliations and nonprofit groups from being involved in lobbying activities. But uh, court rulings have established that to probably be something close to 10 to 15 percent. A 501c3 could, could be involved up to 10 to 15 percent of their overall efforts could be involved in lobbying to affect legislature. But we're silent upon the issue. A group such as the National Right to Life, Americans United for Life, the National Pro Life Alliance are some of the groups that are involved with enacting the, po the policies, the restrictions that have been enacted over the last, last few years. I think we need to get, inv get involved on some level. Find these groups, consider regular monthly donations, get on their email list so you know when the petitions are coming out. We have to reawaken to this horror. Remember after World War II, everyone was so critical of the German people for letting that happen, you know? It wasn't just the Nazis but they accused the entirety of the German population as being complicit in, the, in what was taking place there in the Holocaust. But I guarantee you, a lot fewer, a much lower percentage of the population there knew what was really happening to the Jews than know what's happening to babies here. Everyone here knows what's happening. We need to reawaken to this. There is some good news. Uh, the numbers have fallen off. They're the, the lowest in, 2000, in 2011, they had reached the lowest level since 1973 when Roe versus Wade was passed. Roe versus Wade, dramatic increase, reached up to about 5,000 babies per day, and it's now fallen off, now back down to about 3,000 babies per day. Well, we have to do something. We need to stand up, get involved, and start protecting what is the most innocent of people in our society, the most innocent. Remember, God created us in his image. You could argue what that mean, meant, but it clearly was not biological anatomy, bilateral symmetry and, and uh, you know, having five fingers and five toes, and clearly it was not that. The image of God, we are creating God's image. We are spiritual beings created with the capacity for love, for love. And that is the most important law. Jesus, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important law? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbors yourself. Love, the outflowing of love, is what the church has gotten away from. We're too involved with judging other people for their sins. We're not called to judge people outside of the church for their sins. Only God can judge whether something is a sin to that person. A sin by definition is something a person knows is wrong, but does it anyway. And only God can judge whether that person knows that what they are doing is wrong. We cannot, we're not called to judge people for their sins outside of the church. All, the only attitude they should be getting from us is one of love. One of love. But there are certain things we know are wrong, that everyone knows are wrong. A person may not know that their homosexual activity is wrong, but everyone knows when they harm someone else, that's wrong. We have a built-in sense of right and wrong that gives us that insight. Some sins are only defined by the Bible. Harming someone else, we know from our built-in sense of right and wrong. It, we know that killing someone else is wrong. We know that bashing them over, to, we, stealing from them is wrong. And everyone knows that killing a baby is wrong. Unless they've been convinced by some abortion industry that it's not a baby. All it is is a little mass of tissue. Education helps. Pointing out where, these, where this baby really is in developmental stages helps. But I'd argue that at the moment of conception, you saw how quickly that thing, it changed in the zebrafish. 21 hours. Can we really ourselves say when that is a baby and when it isn't? The moment of conception, everything changes, and everything changes rapidly. We need to, we need to re reawaken to that. But what, what we were given by God was an extraordinary thing. The human body is like nothing else. But uh, remember, this is just a show. We're like a marionette operating a little puppet here. But we are really a spiritual being, one with a great capacity for love. And we need to allow that love to begin to flow out of us like we were called to do. Let the Spirit of God fill us and let the love of God flow out to us, to everyone around us. Unfortunately, I think we, have too, we too quickly adopt a position of uh, self-reliance. You know, the American, sense of a, the American sense of capitalism and looking out for number one, and I think the church has lost uh, the outflowing of love, the charitable giving that we're supposed to have. And I think uh, 
the fact that we've moved away from such critical issues as abortion kind of speaks to that. We need to reawaken. But it's an incredible thing that God has made for us. We have to serve a wonderful God. We think about what, he, what it is that he has made this wonderful ecosystem he put together, all the various animals and plants that we love, and this, this body that he made us. That is the pinnacle of the creation itself, this biological form. But we are itself a spiritual being. 